here today. Beautiful, sunshiny day. Let's uh, just commit our time here to the Lord. Heavenly Father, God, we just come before you right now. Lord God, I ask that you would speak to each one of our hearts, not, not through me, but through your word, through your Holy Spirit, Lord God, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so today we're going to continue our series in the book of Judges, uh, which according to 1 Corinthians 10, 11, uh, tells us that we are to learn from the examples of those in the Bible uh, that have come before us. And... Um, it's just so often to, to, to think of these guys in these times and how we're so different, but, but really there's so many parallels, right, for today, for us today. Really, I think the basic thinking here in, in the book of Judges, uh, which, which is a book of problems and failures and a lot of imperfection, <laughs> um, but, but so similar today, right? Um, they knew who the true God was, so do we. They turn to God for salvation, so do we. They turn to God when they got into the big problems and they got desperate, so do we. And most of the rest of the time, every man did what was right in his own eyes, (laughs) and so do we. Now, we often, I think, fool ourselves today thinking that, well, the right that we're doing in our eyes really is the right. (laughs) There's the difference. Yeah, but we're really doing the right. Um, but often our definition of right just boils down to not doing what's wrong, right? Well, I mean, you know, we live in a state of grace. How can we go wrong? Well, (laughs) we do. The Christian life is not a blank check that we get to just fill in however we want. We're to die to ourselves, take up our crosses, and follow him. We're his check. We're his check to be spent in his way, We are to be living sacrifices, not living for ourselves. And that's and that's where I think so many of these problems we see come. So let's let's not be arrogant and let's put ourselves in their shoes and learn the lessons. (laughs) Today we're gonna dive into the story of Jephthah in Judges chapter 9. First, we really need to to finish up uh, in Judges chapter 8. We had started before quite a few weeks ago with the story of Gideon. We kind of dove into the middle of the book. It just, it fit in with some of the other things that was on my heart. And so we kind of dove into the middle of the book first with the story of Gideon in Judges chapter 8. Last week, we then got to talking about Deborah and Barak, who were the uh, the first judges that we have a lot of information about. There's quite a few judges here where it's just a paragraph or, or small bits of information, not a lot to go on. Um, so we talked about uh, Deborah and Barak, and, um, and so I want to actually pick up uh, the story a little bit here in Judges chapter 8 with the death of Gideon, and that's kind of where we, we, left, we left Gideon's story at his death, but, uh, but really uh, kind of continues on as we'll see here today in Judges chapter 8, and starting in verse 33, we read, then it came about as soon as Gideon was dead that the sons of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals. And they made, and they made Baal Berith their God, right? And if, you're, if that's playing in the back of your mind, right, this is, this is the same thing that, that Jeremiah was talking about in days much later, right? P- playing the harlot with other gods, not being, having a true and faithful heart to the one true God. And why did they make Baal Berith their God? Were they confused? Did they really think he, he was a God? No. No, that's why they always turned back to God when they needed saving, when they needed deliverance. Right? But it was a lot more fun. It was a lot more fun to do the Baal Berith stuff than God stuff, the true God stuff. In verse 34, thus the sons of Israel did not remember the Lord their God. They put him aside. Right? Not that they literally forgot, but they chose not to remember, not to think about the Lord their God. Who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side, nor did they show kindness to the household of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon. Remember, he had changed his name to Jeroboam or Jerubbabel. In accordance with all the good 
that Gideon had done to Israel because Gideon had 70 sons. <laughs> and that was way too many, by the way. <laughs> way too many. That was not what Deuteronomy warned that the leaders should do. They should, were not specifically told in Deuteronomy, when you go into the land, right, do not multiply wives for your, for your leaders, your kings. And Gideon did that. So Gideon had 70 sons, and he also had another son <laughs> by the name of Abimelech with a woman who was not his wife. Abimelech then conspired here in Judges chapter 8 against his 70 brothers, and he cut a deal. I'm going to kind of paraphrase here uh, a bit of the story here. Uh, he cut a deal with the men of Shechem and the men of Beth Milo and said, hey, hey look, do you really want these 70 sons? You, do you want to deal with all of them? How about you just deal with me? And he, his mother <laughs> was from their people. And so they cut this deal. And they gave uh, Abimelech a bunch of money. And he hired a bunch of worthless guys. And they went and they killed the 70 sons of Gideon, his 70 half-brothers. Killed them on one stone. However, there was one son who escaped. His name was uh, Joash. And uh, as the uh, men of Shechem uh, crowned Abimelech the king, uh, Joash escaped and he went to a high hill and he called out to the people and to Abimelech in Judges uh, chapter 9 and verse 16. He says this, Now therefore... Speaking to, to all those, his brothers are dead. Abimelech's the new king. Now, therefore, if you have dealt in truth and integrity in making Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and his house, and if you have dealt with Gideon as he has deserved, for my father fought for you and risked his life and delivered you from the hand of Midian. Remember when, when there was no hope in Israel. But you have risen against my father's house today, and you have killed his sons, 70 men on one stone, and have made Abimelech, the son of his maidservant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your relative. If then you have dealt in truth and integrity with Jeroboam and his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech, and let him rejoice in you. But if not... Let fire come out from Abimelech and consume the men of Shechem and Beth Milo. And let fire come out from the men of Shechem and Beth Milo and consume Abimelech. Then Jotham escaped and fled and went to Beer and remained there because of Abimelech, his brother. Here we go. Jotham is the correct name of this young son of Gideon who escaped the slaughter of his 70 brothers. And so he proclaims a curse a judgment uh, upon Abimelech and the men who made him king and slaughtering the 70 sons of Gideon. And then throughout the rest of the chapter, uh, Judges chapter 8 and Judges chapter 9, we read the sad story of the treachery of Abimelech against the men of Shechem and them toward Abimelech and how they end up slaughtering and, and killing all of each other. And in Judges 9, uh, verse 56, we read the summary here. Thus God repaid the wickedness of Abimelech, which he had done to his father in killing his 70 brothers. And also God returned the wickedness, all the wickedness, of the men of Shechem on their heads, and the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam, came upon them. Godlessness, turning to baal Berith ends in tragedy. So let's continue on in Judges chapter 10. Now after Abimelech died, Tola the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, arose to save Israel. And he lived in Shamer in the hill country of Ephraim. He judged Israel 23 years. Then he died and was buried in Shamer. Again, another judge here. Many of these judges we just have small bits of information about. There's really four main judges that we have much information about. We're going to get into Jephthah here later today. And after him, verse 3, Jair the Gileadite arose and judged Israel 22 years. And he had 30 sons and rode on, that, 
rode on 30 donkeys, and they had 30 cities in the land of Gilead that are called Havath Jer to this day. And Jer died and was buried in Cainon. So we had two good judges who turned the people back to the Lord. And then we read here in Judges chapter 10 and verse 6, Then the sons of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the sons of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. Once again, any god other than the true god. You see, if they were seeking for truth, they would have picked you know, one of these. No, they're all good enough. As long as it's not the true god. Thus they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. The anger of the Lord burned against Israel. Again, it's not because of imperfection, not because they were trying and failing, right? Because that's what we often do, right? We try and we fail. We're not perfect. And sometimes we fail worse than other times. But, but they're not trying and failing here. They're forsaking. They're forgetting. They're giving up. They're taking anything but the truth. And this is why the anger of the Lord burns against them. And so we read here, he sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the sons of Ammon. And they afflicted and crushed the sons of Israel that year. And for 18 years, they afflicted the sons of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in Gilead in the land of the Amorites. So now we have kind of a specific geographical area. Remember that the tribes were split by the Jordan River, which was a, a major landmark geographical barrier. It was a, difficult to cross this very large river. And so now we're going to be talking about uh, very much the, it, what's happening in the land of Gilead, which is the two and a half tribes uh, that are on the, uh, let's see, that would be the west side of the Jordan River. Beyond the Jordan in Gilead, that's called the land of Gilead there, that, which was the land of the Amorites. And then in verse 9, it says here that the sons of Ammon crossed the Jordan to fight against Judah, Benjamin, and the house of Ephraim. That's the other nine and a half tribes on, on the other side. So that Israel was greatly distressed. And at least they're good, as we, when we really get in big trouble. Well, we better turn to God. So in verse 10, the sons of Israel cried to the Lord, saying, We have sinned against you. For indeed, we have forsaken our God and served the Baals. Because right? they knew all the way along. It's not like this was really a great revelation. But, but they've been caught. They've been caught and they know it. But here we read something different that we, we haven't read yet in the book of Judges. Verse 11, so the Lord said to the sons of Israel, did I not deliver you from the Egyptians, the Amorites, the sons of Ammon, and the Philistines? Also when the Sidonians and the Malachites and the Mayanites oppressed you, you cried out to me, and I delivered you from their hands. Right? So this has been the pattern ever since Joshua. They entered the promised land. Right? They're falling away. They're forsaking the Lord. They're coming back. God's delivering them. And this has been a couple hundred years now, or a hundred, or probably close to 200 years. He says, look, yeah, I have. I've been delivering you <laughs> every time you turn to me. But listen, verse 13, yet, even though I've done all the deliverance, you keep forsaking me and serving other gods. Therefore, I will no longer deliver you. Verse 14, go and cry out to the gods which you've chosen. Let them deliver you in the time of your distress. He's saying, you know what? I'm done playing this game right now. You go, go ask them. I mean, there's your choice. I'm not going to do it this time. Then the sons of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and served the Lord. And God could bear the misery of Israel no longer. 
What I've been telling you is that what God wanted from Israel was a heart of faithfulness, not perfection. And, and these people were not simply destined to fail. They had a choice. If you look carefully at the sequence of events right here in these verses, you can, you can see they sinned, they forsook. God said, all right, that's it. Not doing it. Not doing it. But, but look at what they actually do this time. They said, okay, we have sinned. Do whatever seems good to you, to, you, to, to us. But they did put away the foreign gods and serve the Lord. And then God had compassion. Not, not the compassion first. It was a test. Would, did, did they really mean it? Because there's been a lot of half-heartedness that's been going on. But they did really put away the foreign gods and truly serve the Lord. And then God says, I can't stand it. They're being faithful. <laughs> Way imperfect, but they're being faithful here. And he could bear the misery no longer. Our God is so merciful, so good when we don't deserve it. I mean, they really deserved to, just, like he said, you know what, just you go cry to all these gods that you picked and let's see how that works for you. But God's heart is turned when they said, all right, whatever, do whatever seems good to you, but you know what? We, we really are going to serve God this time. And they did, and God has mercy. Amazing. So the last three sermons, I've, each week I've read one chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, which was the main scripture that they had up to this point in history, right? This is early on. The book of Judges is, is right after uh, Joshua. And so they've really got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and maybe Joshua, if, if that's been all written at this point, probably so. That's it. And, and Deuteronomy, remember, was the playbook, the, the manual, the instruction manual. This is what you're supposed to do when you go into the land, into the promised land. And so I want to read another chapter because, because this really plays into what we've been talking about here, about faithfulness, a faithful heart, not perfection. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. That was proven by Joshua because he was successful. It was proven by Gideon. It was proven by Deborah and Barak. And it is proved again here in Judges chapter 10. Because before God says, God, look, God says, I'm not going to deliver you. You just go pray to these other gods. They turned. They turned. They did put away the foreign gods and serve the Lord. And then God's mercy comes. Because it wasn't too difficult. If it was about perfection, if it was about just keeping the law so much better than they did, it would have been impossible, right? I mean, it really would have. That's not what God was after at any point of this time. The commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you. Well, keeping all the commandments, that's impossible. That's more than too difficult. That's impossible. But what God is wanting is a faithful heart, which is possible. We can turn our hearts to God. He says here in Deuteronomy 30, this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? But the word is very near you. They had the word. It is in your mouth and in your heart that you may observe it. That's what God wanted all the way along. It's what he wanted back in the book of Judges. It's what he wanted in Genesis. It's what he wanted throughout the whole New Old Testament. It's what he wants today. He wants our heart turned to him. 
They had the word. We've got the word. They had Deuteronomy. It had everything that they needed to know to turn to God with all their heart. The word is very near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart that you may observe it. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity and death and adversity. In that I command you today not to keep the commandments perfectly, but to love the Lord your God. That's it. He wants our faithful heart. We can love him. Not perfectly, but we can. It's not too difficult. In that, I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways. Look, you can't keep all the commandments, but you can walk in his ways. It's loving the Lord your God and walking in his, all, all his ways. If you don't love him, you're not going to walk in his ways. If you love him and walk in his ways, then what will you do? You will keep the commandments. Not all of them, not perfectly. To walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and that the Lord your God may bless you in the land where you are entering to possess. This is what God required. He says it's not too difficult. You can do it. And they did it right here in Judges chapter 10. When God gave up on them, they said, you know what? We better get serious here. And no matter what, we are going to serve the Lord. And then here's the contrast in Deuteronomy chapter 30. So, so he says, look, I'm commanding you today. Love the Lord your God. Walk in his ways and keep all his commandments and his statutes and judgments. But, so here's the contrast. And, and as you'll see when we finish the but, the contrast is not perfectly keeping the law. But, verse 17, Deuteronomy 30, 17, but if your heart turns away, that's the contrast right there. If your heart turns away, if your heart turns to Baal Barith and the God and, and all the fun stuff and all the cool stuff and all the immoral stuff and all the stuff that you can do in this world and please your flesh. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey, it's not that you just can't do it, but you can't. <laughs> but it's about our heart. But if your heart turns away and you will not obey and are drawn away, if you are drawn away, see, our, we all know what that means, right? But if your heart is drawn away, and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You will not prolong your days in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. So choose life. Because it wasn't too difficult. This was not impossible. It wasn't impossible for them today. It's not impossible for us today. Can we save ourselves? Is the choice here salvation? No. <laughs> no. But the choice is, will you have a faithful heart that is turned toward God to walk in his ways? Which then, you're going to try to obey him. That's what love and walking in somebody's ways means. Choose life. Not because you are making life for yourself, that you've earned your salvation. No, it's a heart faithfully turn toward God. This is what they were told in Deuteronomy 30. This is what you're to do when you go in the land. And this is what did happen here in Judges chapter 10. They did turn to God with their heart after God said, you know what? I'm done. You just go cry out to these gods you've chosen. But they did. They turned to the Lord. And so in Judges 10, 16, when they put away their foreign gods and they served the Lord, the Lord began to deliver them just as he had promised in Deuteronomy 30, <laughs> what we just read. So let's pick the story back up in Judges 10, 17. So the sons of Ammon were summoned and they camped in Gilead. And the sons of Israel gathered together and they camped in Mizpah. And the people, the leaders of Gilead, said to one another, okay, so the, the enemy's coming now, <laughs> They're coming for war. 
And they, so they gather the army and they go, okay, now who's going to lead us? <laughs> now we got a problem. Well, the army's there, but who's going to do this? Who's going to do this job? And in Judges chapter 11, verse 1, we read that Jephthah, the Gileadite, was a valiant warrior, but he was the son of a harlot. And Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you're the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows gathered themselves about Jephthah, and they went out with him. There is not much perfect going on in the book of Judges. <laughs> it just isn't. But Jephthah is one of the heroes of faith in Hebrews 11, right? Because it's not about perfection. It's not being the great. It's be, turn our heart to God. Obey God. And so it came about in verse 4, after a while, that so we kind of have Jephthah's history here, Judges chapter 1, 11, 1 through 3. And then in verse 4, we go back to the narrative. So it came about after a while, the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. And when the sons of Ammon fought against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to Jephthah from the land to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our chief that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. Then Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me? And drive me out of my father's house. Why have you come now when you're in trouble? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, For this reason we have now returned to you, that you may go with us and fight with the sons of Ammon and become head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. So Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you take me back to fight against the sons of Ammon and the Lord gives them up to me, will I become your head? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord is witness between us, Surely we will do as we have said. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and chief over them, and Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. And so Jephthah also had a heart for God. And he was a strong man, rejected by his brothers. And then in a good part of the rest of the chapter here, a Jephthah sends messengers to the king of the sons of Ammon, saying, What is between you and me that, that you have come out to me to fight against my land? And then uh, uh, they give the king of Ammon gives this answer, Well, Israel took away all our lands uh, years ago, and so we're getting them back now. This is it. We're getting them back. And then uh, Jephthah goes back and gives uh, the king of Moab and the people of Moab a history lesson of what God did and how Israel, if you remember, as they were getting ready to enter the promised land, um, God told them not to fight at first against these people, but they asked permission. May we, enter, may we go through your land. We'll pay for the food. We'll pay for the water. We need to get to our land across the Jordan. And all these countries uh, refused, and they were uh, suspicious, and then the Amorites not only just refused, but they came out to destroy Israel. Israel destroyed them, and they took the land. And that's, that's what happened. So Jephthah gives them this uh, history lesson here in um, Judges chapter 11. And we'll pick up the uh, <laughs> story uh, maybe with verse 23. Uh, where Jephthah says, Now the Lord, the God of Israel, drove out the Amorites from before his people Israel. Are you then to possess the land? Do you not possess what Chemosh, your God, gives you to possess? So whatever the Lord has driven out before us, we will possess it. Now are you any better than Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab? Did he ever strive with Israel? Did he ever fight against them? While Israel lived in Heshbon and its villages, in Aroer and its villages, and in all the cities on the banks of the river Arnon, 300 years, why did you not recover them? Therefore I have not sinned against you, but you are doing me wrong by making war against me. May the Lord, the judge, judge between the sons of Israel and the sons of Ammon. But the king of the sons of Ammon disregarded the message which Jephthah sent him. Now the spirit of the Lord, in verse 
29, came upon Jephthah, so that he passed through Gilead and Manasseh, and he passed through Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he went on to the sons of Ammon. Then Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give me the sons of Ammon, give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. And this is actually the thing that Jephthah's kind of most well-known and famous for. So Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. He struck them with a very great slaughter from Eroer to the entrance of Mineth, 20 cities, as far as Abel, Kiramim. So the sons of Ammon were subdued before the sons of Israel. Now, all Jephthah needed to do here, though, folks, was simply rely upon the promises of God, right? Deuteronomy said, look, if you turn to me with your heart, I'll deliver you, and you'll have peace in the land. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that if you really want favor with God, you should make an extra vow, a great big promise that if God does this special thing for you, you're going to do this special thing for him. Now, I don't know, maybe there is a time when that still may be appropriate, but, but we're just simply not instructed in Scripture to do that. But Jephthah did. He said, okay, here's the deal, God. If you give me victory, what, the first thing that comes out of my house when I come home, I'm going to offer it to you as a sacrifice. And unfortunately for Jephthah, the first thing that greeted him when he came Home was his one and only daughter. And the story, as the story goes, she says, Father, it's, it's okay. He says, oh, daughter, daughter, what have you done? She says, Father, it's okay. You, you better fulfill your vows to the Lord. It appears as if he may have sacrificed his daughter. The scripture doesn't tell us for sure. I've read some things that indicate that maybe he's uh, kind of like Samuel and Eli. She was just simply set apart to the Lord. I don't know. But we see a bit of tragedy in the midst of victory again. It's not perfection. And then the story is still not quite over. It takes what seems to be a strange turn, but if you've been following along in the book of Judges, I think you may notice a pattern. So let's see what happens next in Judges chapter 12 and verse 1. Then the men of Ephraim were summoned, and they crossed to Zaphon, to Jephthah, and said to him, Why did you cross over to fight against the sons of Ammon without calling us to go with you? We are going to burn your house down on you. <laughs> so what happened here? Well, after the victory, guess what? Guess what? To the victor go the spoils. <laughs> so here, the, the sons of Israel were the big underdogs, but they won through Jephthah's, Jephthah's leadership, and they probably got a lot of spoil. And so now all of a sudden, after the fact, the men of Ephraim are going, holy cow, look at all that stuff. <laughs> we could have... We Whoa, we missed out. They missed the boat. And so then they blamed Jephthah. We were ready to go. You didn't call us. We're going to show you now. We're going to take, we're going to burn your house down. We're going to take all this stuff. <laughs> now Jephthah said to them, I and my people were at great strife with the sons of Ammon. And when I called you, you did not deliver me from their hand. When I saw that you would not deliver me, I took my life in my hands and crossed over against the sons of Ammon. And the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought Ephraim. What on earth? He... Here we've got this tremendous deliverance from God. And what happened? It's turning into civil war, literally. What is going on? 
So Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought against Ephraim, and the men of Gilead defeated Ephraim. Because they said, you are fugitives, O Ephraim, of Ephraim, O Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and in the midst of Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan River opposite of Ephraim. Again, the Jordan River is a very difficult river. It's a broad, wide, fast enough flowing river, difficult to cross. So they, carried, they captured the fords, which was the easy place to cross. And it happened when any of the fugitives of Ephraim who had crossed over, right, to, to, to come and get the spoil, to, to teach Jephthah a lesson, they didn't like this guy either. <laughs> So it happened when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, let me cross over, the men of Gilead would say, are you an Ephraimite? <laughs> and if he said, no, not me, <laughs> they would say, say now, Shibboleth. <laughs> but he would say, Sibboleth, because he could not pronounce it correctly. <laughs> he had a little bit of a dialect issue, you know. Y'all, <laughs> say y'all, <laughs> except this particular word, boy, they said it Sibboleth over there, and they said it Shibboleth over here, and they just couldn't say it right, <laughs> how hard as they tried. And then they would seize him and s killed him at the fords of the Jordan. Thus there fell at that time 42,000 of Ephraim. And Jephthah judged Israel six years, and Jephthah the Gileadite died and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. 42,000 Ephraimites died in the midst of God's great deliverance and victory. What is going on? But do you remember the pattern? What happened when Deborah and Barak went and fought? Right? Remember Miraz? Miraz, the city that would not come to the help of the Lord, was cursed by God and never heard of again. Do you remember what happened when Gideon was fighting against the Midianites and he was pursuing the kings of Midian? And he came to his brothers in Shechem and, and not Shechem, but Penuel. And they said, oh, we're not going to help you. Gideon went back and he killed all those men. We're seeing death and destruction of Israelites in the midst of God's deliverance. What is going on? Are these simply random events? Are these tragedies just historical footnotes or just a part of the narrative? I tell you not. It is a warning. And this was the warning that God had given them in Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 14. He said this, now, not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath that, that you will be my people and I will be your God. Not, a, not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath, but both with those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not with us here today. In other words, not everyone quite had gathered together. And he says here, For you know how we lived in the land of Egypt, how we came through the midst of the nations which you passed. Moreover, you have seen their abominations and their idols of wood and stone and silver and gold, which they had with them, so that there will not be among you a man or a woman or a family or a tribe whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of those nations. That there will not be among you a root bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. What is he talking about here? In Deuteronomy chapter 29, he's talking about the blessings for obedience. right? But even if you've got a whole country that's primarily being obedient and, and following after God, does that mean everybody's going to? Actually, no. No, we kind of know that, right? There's going to be some rebels in the midst. And so God prescribes in verse 18 here, he says, if there is a man or woman or a family or a tribe whose heart turns away, again, 
What does he keep talking about throughout the entire book of Deuteronomy? What does he want? He wants your heart. Not talking about perfect obedience to every law that was given. He says, if their heart turns away from the Lord our God, and not just to sin, but, but to go and serve other gods, he says, he does not want there to be a root-bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. Verse 19, it shall be when he hears the words of this curse that he will boast saying, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart. Right? Because you live in a land of peace. You live in a land that's being blessed by God for obedience. So even if you live in a land that, that is just dripping with the blessing of God, there's going to be some rebel hearts who say, I'm not following God, but boy, am I sure going to take advantage of this great situation. <laughs> and I'm going to turn my heart away and just enjoy all the greatness, the protection, the blessing, the rain. That is a root bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. And it shall be, here, verse 19 again, it shall be when he hears the words of this court, curse that he will boast saying I have peace though I walk in the stubborn stubbornness of my heart in order to destroy the watered land with the dry verse 20 the Lord shall never be willing to forgive him but rather the anger of the Lord and his jealousy because it's not about perfect obedience to the law but it's about a heart turned toward God but the anger of the Lord and his jealousy will burn against that man or that woman or that family or that tribe. And every curse which is written in this book will rest on him and the Lord will blot out his name from under heaven. The Lord, verse 21, will single him out for adversity from all the tribes of Israel according to all the curses of the covenant which are written in the book of the law. And that, I believe, is exactly what we're seeing here with the, those cursed in Miraz, the Tower of Penuel that would not help Gideon. And now here, now here we see a whole, practically 42,000 of Ephraim. This is not just a random, oh, they got a little jealous and whatever. I believe this is absolutely that their hearts were not turned. And so God allowed them to, to well up this jealousy and this bitterness and this greed to go take the spoil and be destroyed because God said he promises when you go in this land and I'm delivering and I'm blessing the land, which is exactly what he was doing through Jephthah here, but you've got a tribe or a family or a man or woman whose heart is turned away, they will be destroyed. In the New Testament in 2 Peter verse 2, 4, we read this. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness, reserved for judgment. And if God did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them an example of those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteousness unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh and its corrupt desires and despise authority. This is both a great comfort and a fearful warning. God knows how to rescue those whose hearts turn to him. And he knows how to make the judgment come upon those whose hearts are not. And I believe that's the pattern that we're seeing and we're actually going to continue see, to see in the book of Judges. These are not just a kind of a weird historical footnote. This is a warning. It's the warning of Deuteronomy 30. It's the warning of 2 Peter chapter 2. Look, God knows how to rescue. 
Though odds are completely against you, you can trust God knows how to rescue. But he also, if there's a man or a woman or a family or a whole tribe, if your heart turns away, if you think you're going to participate in all the blessings of those who do turn, when God rains down his grace and blessing, <laughs> he will single you out and you will be destroyed. And what is the application for us today? Look, we can know God, we can love Jesus, we can read our Bible, we can go to church every Sunday and still get ourselves into a world of trouble because we're walking in our own way. We're walking in the way that just seems right to us because our heart is not fully turned. We're, we feel secure. We're saved. We're blessed. It is a warning to us all. May our hearts be fully turned to cling to God, to walk in his ways, to obey him oh, perfectly. We're going to fail, but with a faithful heart. It's not too difficult. It's not out of reach. We, we cannot make excuses. We cannot make excuses for indulging the flesh in its corrupt desires. We must turn in repentance, walk in all of God's ways, and cling to him because he is our life.